we all know that uh, human life, human society sends us different messages, messages that we kind of, uh, in the long run, sort of absorb and then become part of the way we think. And one of the common themes of human society that, that it tells us is that what the world needs more of is exceptional people, right? Exceptional people is the key. And there are lots of different ways that as we hear this message, that becomes involved with how we think about ourselves and the world. And you know, we start striving to be exceptional. Uh, and people strive in all different ways. Some people want to be smarter than the rest. Others want to be more attractive than the rest, or stronger, or more athletic, or richer, or more creative, or more likable, or more powerful, or whatever it is, or some combination of any of these, right? We want to be exceptional. We want to be better. We want to be the best. But by and large, whatever it is, we all want to be some sort of this exceptional thing, which is sort of a sad reality because the nature of something being exceptional is not everyone can be it, right? Otherwise, it wouldn't be exceptional. Uh, but be that, that as it may, there are entire industries which are founded upon this idea of, you know, that we need to be better, that we need to be exceptional. And, you know, if you look at, for instance, that's what celebrity culture is all about, right? Beautiful and talented people who are sort of uh, more amazing than us, and we kind of watch them and look at them and, and, and are in awe of them. Uh, that's what the self-help industry is about, and it's big money in our country, right? People becoming better in one way or another through magazines or books or uh, diets or whatever. Uh, the message is you need to become a better version of you. And you know, even sadly, sometimes schools fall into this a little bit too much, where they, they ramp up the pressure on kids so much that you need to be the absolute best students with the highest GPA and the best sporting achievements and the most volunteer hours. I mean, it is good for kids to strive, but of course not everyone could be the very best, otherwise they wouldn't be the best, right? So there's this tremendous pressure on all ages in life to be the best, to be exceptional. <clears throat> There's no doubt that in this world, when it comes to the important stuff, the things we see as important, uh, the big issues, the big undertakings, the ones who run the big organizations, the ones who make the headlines, the ones who are on the covers of magazines, the ones who are asked the important questions, the things that they, you know, what do you think? It's the ones who we view as exceptional. Well, you know, if we're talking about important issues, and big undertakings, and if we're people of faith, then what could be more vital of an undertaking than God's mission in the world, right? And for Christians, what could have been a more vital undertaking in God's mission than when Jesus was on earth with his original 12 disciples? When he's just starting his movement, his message, his gospel, you would think that this is the time that it's crucial to find the best people. And so, again, with something so important, based on our worldly human way of thinking, one would think that Jesus would have selected his disciples from among the best and the brightest of his day, right? Look for all the top people and make those people his disciples. Well, this is wrong. This is not what Jesus did at all, right? As far as we can tell, Jesus did not select his disciples based on those who were most highly regarded in society. Rather, if you look at Jesus' little roster of disciples, it's nothing but a list of misfits and nobodies. You know, in the case of the misfits, I, I mentioned these two last week, uh, but we have Matthew, the hated tax collector. We have Simon, the radical former revolutionary, a very divisive person. And then in the case of most of the other disciples, we get to this category of nobodies, where we have no idea what they might have done which likely means that they had no big reputation in the eyes of society. As far as we can tell, they weren't connected to any important families, they held no esteemed positions, and they had no famous accomplishments to speak of. And then lastly, if we look at the occupations of the disciples, most of them we don't know, uh, but there's one group we do know about, is that there was a group who had been, again, on the totem pole of society, these mighty fishermen who we hear about today, uh, these four disciples named Simon, Peter, James, and John. So in our reading, as we heard, uh, these fishermen are at sea doing what fishermen try to do, trying to make a living out of fishing. But of course, on this day, there are no fish. They're casting out their nets, and they're coming back empty. 
But suddenly along comes Jesus. He's been teaching in the area, it says, and he tells them to put their nets on the other side of the boat, which all that sounded like a pretty dumb suggestion, right? That's not how fishing works, where, you know, no fish, a million fish on the side. That's not usually how it works. Uh, but for some reason, they take a leap of faith and do it anyway. I wonder why. You know, part of me thinks it was just that they wanted to shut up and sometimes you can make someone be quiet with a dumb suggestion by doing it and showing it doesn't work. <laughs> or maybe it's because they watched him teach. Uh, Jesus probably had a little bit of a reputation by then. Uh, maybe they've heard this guy has some powers and they're willing to, you know, go out on a limb and see what will happen. But the important thing is that, for whatever reason, they act at least in their actions in the spirit of trust, and they listen to Jesus. And we've all kind of probably heard the rest of the story, right? The nets come in with more fish than they've ever caught in their lives, absolutely overflowing with fish. And then this interesting scene plays out where it says in the scriptures, when Simon Peter saw it, he fell at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. I wonder why, G, why, why Peter said this, you know? Why was this Peter's response? But I think we all know, right? I think we have to guess that this is his response because he's caught up in the same mindset that we're talking about earlier in this sermon. Peter knows that it's not normal what just happened. And I think on some level, he knows that he is in the presence of holiness. And you know what's happening, I think? He feels inadequate. He feels unexceptional. He knows that in normal human society, it would never see the day where a flawed, everyday fisherman would be at the center of God's mission or the center of history. It's kind of a laughable thing, right? Or in his case, this kind of shameful thing. You know, I can't be in your presence. I'm not good enough. But it's a laughable thing if we try to kind of translate what was happening here to our human society. Hey, there's some of you aware of TED Talks, right, where smart, important people get up and, and talk about, you know, interesting things. It would be like having a janitor at a TED Talk talk about, you know, here's how you mop, right? <laughs> it would never happen. Or it would be like having a poor housekeeping worker from a hotel being on the cover of Cosmo in her housekeeping outfit. It's just, it, it wouldn't happen in our world. Because in our event mindset, again, the world needs more exceptional people, and we want to focus on exceptional people as we see them. And yet Jesus responds with this famous prediction, which we've heard in our children's sermon. Do not be afraid, for from now on you will be catching people. We see here, fishers of men, but it's people, right? You will be catching people. And as we read further, we'll discover in the Gospels that Jesus is right. God is going to use these normal disciples to do great things. God uses Peter and his comrades as the spearheads of this Christian movement, which today has over a billion adherents. I mean, it's an amazing thing. But something we have to remember, even as we think about the amazing thing that these 12 are part of, is that they won't get this honor because they're more perfect or exceptional than the rest of us, even after they're called. In fact, again, if we keep on reading the Gospels and remember some of these stories, we'll see that the disciples often get things wrong and have to be corrected by Jesus. They often get caught up in their own egos in, in, in this ministry. Uh, they bicker about who's greatest. And in, again and again in the Gospels, we see these disciples going on, and Jesus has to sort of correct them and reframe their minds to show them that God's world of grace is different from any other world they've ever been part of. And so, sort of the conclusion is, the disciples are a mess, and yet God uses them to do great things anyway. And really, this leads me to the central point of, of this sermon, which is that, you know, as Christians, I think most of us know on some level that we are called to be part of the ministry of Jesus, right? That it's not just the job of people who wear collars or work at churches. You all know that you have a part in this ministry. And yet I think for a lot of us, and actually even pastors, there can be a barrier to getting involved in ministry. There can kind of be a barrier of confidence of if we can really be used by God. And that barrier I'm talking about is a mental barrier that stems from the mindset we've been discussing in this sermon, uh, which is that we've been told that the world needs more exceptional people, 
and we kind of transfer this mindset onto God and ministry. And we all, you know, we kind of like to do ministry for God, and yet we feel like we're not exceptional enough, not holy enough, not spiritual enough. But I think here's the thing that we all need to hear. God doesn't need more exceptional people in his kingdom. God needs more courageous people. Courage. But I'm not talking about any kind of courage. Courage can be foolish. foolish. Uh, courage can be self-seeking or self-serving. Uh, I'm talking about grace-filled courage. And grace-filled courage is, is the kind of courage that has to do with having the courage to offer God's love to people who need it. And I'd say that's what's needed, courage, because I think our biggest obstacle to ministry is fear, right? We're afraid to tell people about what God means to us many times, especially Lutherans, right? That's kind of a little bit scared about that. Sometimes even our own children, we're not sure if we have the right words to tell them about our faith. We're afraid to, you know, engage people uh, who need help. We're, we're sometimes afraid to engage the poor uh, in the hurting and the lost. And we're afraid because we suspect that, again, we don't have what it takes. But most of the time, I think what's needed in God's ministry isn't talent or brilliance or anything like that, but it's the courage to offer God's love. And, you know, we often underestimate the, the tremendous impact that a simple courage and love can have on another person. Some of you have been asking me about this, this neat little cross. This comes from Egypt. I think I, I shared that uh, my wife and I were in Cairo for one year uh, during my pastoral internship. Uh, we had a wonderful year. We worked at this little, it was a colonial church from the ages of, of the British occupation, but uh, the last few decades it's been stewarded by Lutherans, uh, so a very different feel now. And it was this beautiful community made up of people from around the world, Americans, but also Egyptians, and Brazilians, and French, and Africans, and just this wonderful mix of people. Uh, and, and so we were in this, this community. We also uh, helped with this refugee program that operated out of the church, uh, mostly the Sudanese refugees. But uh, after having kind of, it was a different year, because we were in Cairo, but a really good year for about six months, uh, around the time of late January, something happened. If you're old enough to remember, do you remember the Arab Spring? Uh, the Arab Spring happened while we were there. Uh, we had been at this place having, uh, I think, a drink and a, a snack, and we were watching on the news, and, you know, actually in Egypt, there had been protests the whole time we were there, but they tended to be tiny, controlled, and there were always a hundred cops nearby, and they were ready to just kind of, you know, go away. And, and the, the powers that be, which were pretty corrupt and dictatorial, kind of tolerated a little bit of protest. It's like they can let off their steam, but it never leads to anything. But we had heard that there was going to be this big protest. Uh, we'd been on a, a tour earlier in the week, and we'd heard there was going to be this big protest. And, and so we're watching TV as we're having the snack out, and we see this protest on TV, and it, it looks a little bigger than usual. And, uh, and over time, over the next few hours, we got more serious, and they start throwing rocks, and then what's weird, not a lot of professionalism in the police. The police started throwing rocks back. Uh, and, and, and you just saw it grow from a few hundred to a few more hundred to what looked like thousands. And eventually, we went home like, we're going to go home and just see what's going on. But no one expected it to be too big. But we kept on watching, and this crowd was just swelling. And pretty soon, uh, you saw the police kind of look around and realize that there were about 100 of them and like 5,000 people. And they, they left. In fact, in this church that we were part of, it had a, 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 a fence around and a wall. Uh, and uh, one of the days after the revolution, the, the groundskeeper showed us, he walked us in, and there was an empty police uniform with walk right here, just lying on the ground. The policeman had jumped the wall, taken off his clothes, and run, because he didn't want to be seen. <laughs> but anyways, we were, uh, we were uh, watching this on TV, it got bigger and bigger. And then it started getting scary. You started hearing yelling you know, outside and, and all these noises. And it just got more and more intense. And eventually, basically, the police were off the street. There was no more control. And that's when we started hearing kind of gunshots and yelling and all this craziness all around us. The TV uh, was, was our connection for a while. Our cell phones was our connection for a while with, with the community we were with. Well, the government didn't like what was happening. And they didn't want revolutionaries to be able to 
uh, contact each other so they turn off the cell phones and then we can communicate. But we can watch the TV and then the government didn't like people seeing the revolution so they turn off the TV. And here we were totally isolated in this, we lived in this tall, uh, uh, big building on like a sixth floor. We had a little balcony that overlooked things. And as night fell, uh, it was one of the scariest nights of our lives because we started hearing gunshots and screaming and all this stuff. Uh, we heard later that some of the criminal groups came out because there were no police on the streets. And then we started hearing something really scary, uh, kind of this popping and gunfire and lots of yelling. And we learned the next day, you know, we kind of saw a lighting up of something, fire. And we learned the next day it was a mob who went and burned down the police station about three uh, blocks down the road from us. That sounds awful. I want you to understand it's a little bit different there than here. The police were incredibly corrupt and they would, you know, make people go away. Uh, you should never burn down police stations, but there was a lot of animosity because, you know, think of them more as the Gustavo and less as, you know, your friendly neighbor the police. But anyways, it was a scary time. And so we barely slept that night. Uh, we didn't know if we were safe. We certainly didn't feel safe. I remember for our clothes, we had kind of this wardrobe thing in this cutout uh, of, of our uh, closet. And I remember we pulled out the wardrobe a little bit so that if anyone came in, we could hide behind this wardrobe. And the next day, you know, things kind of continued. We were isolated, totally scared, uh, and we started hearing noises uh, down at, at, at ground level. And we didn't want to be seen because, you know, we look different than most people, but we, we kind of crawled out on our balcony and looked, and here were a group of about 20 men with, like, bricks in their hands and kind of homemade weapons and knives, and we're like, oh my gosh, what is happening now? And, and we, you know, we didn't know if we were truly in danger at that point. And it was soon after this that we got a knock on the door, uh, and uh, we looked through the little uh, uh, view hole, and uh, it was this woman who we recognized. We lived right next door in that apartment to a couple of ladies who lived with us. We barely ever spoken to them because we weren't great in Arabic, and they had a ton of English. But kind of a, a young woman, uh, she was wearing her hijab, we assumed she was Muslim. Uh, but here she was, and she had a pitcher of what looked like uh, lime juice in her hand. And so we opened the door, and she said, hi, I just wanted to come in real quick and visit with you. So we let her in, and she said, I know this must be scary for you guys, but I just want you to know everything's going to be OK. Uh, and I brought you this juice. And it was just such a kind gesture. Uh, and we appreciated it immediately, uh, but we were also still scared. And, and especially these men down there with, with the weapons. And we said, yeah, but who are these men? What are they going to do? Are they here to hurt us? And they said, oh, no, no, no. Uh, there's been a lot of, you know, kind of chaos and, and criminal groups around. Those men are from the apartment. They're here to protect us. And, and just this huge relief. Uh, and, and just everything's going to be okay. And she handed us this wonderful homemade squeeze uh, lime juice. And, and uh, long story short, uh, that helped us feel a little bit more comfortable. In the next few days, we were able to get back with our people. We were actually evacuated for two months and, and then went back after a few months and finished our year. But, you know, that little act of courage, which I'm sure it was courage, because she didn't know us, and we were different, and she barely speak the language, uh, but that little courageous act of love made such a transformative effect on our experience of, of that time. And that's what can happen with a courageous act of love. It can change someone's life in a big way. And so I wonder, where is God calling you to offer grace-filled courage? Who is God calling you to show grace to, to pray for, to be generous to, or to invite to church, to invite to a loving community. You know, if we have our eyes and our ears open to God and the world around us, there is always an answer to that question because we live in a world that's absolutely starved for God's love, so there's always an opportunity for mission. So today, we remember that we're part of the answer to these questions, right? You are the one being called to be a disciple. You are the one who's being called to offer God's grace. And you have the opportunity in this to make a difference in the life of another. Not because you're exceptional or better or perfect, but because you have the ability to offer grace courageously. Amen.